Josh Lajani, welcome back to Plant Yourself. What's up, buddy? It's nice to be here. Nice to see your face. Not to, nice to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. My, my face is doing all right. <laughs> it is. It's doing fine. Yeah. And in, 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 um, I didn't shave in, in preparation for this. So we could. Oh, dang. <laughs> so we got a lot to catch up on. But um, principally, I wanted to talk about uh, Burn by Her Herman Ponser and the. Uh, the interview I released yesterday that you uh, that you listened to and you started sending me all these uh, audio messages about what you were thinking. I was like, this is such good stuff. I want to I want to capture it and share it. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read the book. I'm, I will. Um, but my first introduction was that that podcast. And I thought that I thought it was amazing. And there's just so many things that resonated with me in there and it made me go, oh, and I had kind of intuited, but to hear like someone so much smarter and more experienced in, in like actual scientific method talk about these things was, 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 was powerful and liberating in some ways, you know? Yeah. So I want, I mean, I, I, was, I was thinking about it first, it's like, you know, your perspective as an athlete. Mm -hmm. and with your history of of really making really smart decisions and really dumb decisions of course and learning from them as, uh -huh. as we all do um but also your history as a formerly obese person and mm -hmm. the transition but also i was thinking your identity as a hunter gatherer yeah right because you like you've lived not the hadza life but a life that has a lot of um, of that heritage, of a lot of um, of echoes of it, and a lot of traditions that honor that um, in a way that very few people that I know personally do. Mm -hmm. So there was just there was so much as I was reading the book. I think I you know when I first listened to the interview that got me hooked on it, uh, I was like, dude, you got to listen. This is, this one's blowing my mind. Right. I just kept thinking of you in terms of the way you think about the world and how all those experiences have contributed. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe like, where would you like to start? What was the, what was the, like the biggest thing that you heard that you sort of knew, but was like, Oh yeah. I the baseline, see. the baseline energy requirements thing um, that he was talking about. That's what blew my mind was like, you know, first of all, I want to have my baseline calculated like they did in that study that he was talking about, whatever, you know, the, you know, but, but what really blew my mind was it didn't matter how active a population of people was or how lethargic we all have that base, that really sort of baseline um, energy requirement. And we bounce up sort of off of that. And, you know, I, I, it's not like I've fully took it in and understand it enough to like to write my own dissertation on it. But it would it just kind of it kind of um, that kind of blew me away because I felt like, oh, I live an active lifestyle over the long term. I'm going to burn hella more calories than everyone else. Therefore, I'll be able to eat more food and still lose weight that was been my and it and and then and to hear him talk about oh that will work for a while until your body catches up and is able to regulate and it's like oh because something that stuck out in my mind was the 2014 uh new york city marathon because you know I didn't, I wasn't weighing, I wasn't on a scale then, but I know my food approach to that marathon. And you remember that was my third marathon. It was my first year of ever running. I ran my first marathon in like January or February. My second one was in July. And then I think it was November was the, the New York city marathon all in that same year. Right. And so I was of the like I was of the opinion or assumption or or whatever that man I'm going to be training so much this is my third marathon this year that I'm I can just basically the my job is to make sure that I have enough calories 
Mm -hmm. And I'm running so much that I can just kind of just throw as many calories in at myself as possible because I eat whole food, plant-based. I eat really, really clean. But if I'm being real, like I definitely feel like I put on weight going into that New York City marathon. When I looked at my at my photos during the race and and it was um and and it was always been sort of a, a thing to me. I thought maybe I had just stressed my body out and I was just kind of retaining water or I, I didn't know what it was, but I definitely felt puffy and you know dirt and felt like I had put on weight during the New York City marathon. And that's when he talked about how your body kind of gets used to the activity level and start and like pulls calories from other jobs that it's already doing to make up the difference. So we can always, your body's always, no matter how much activity you have in your life, your body's trying to get back to that basal rate, even included, even with the activity included, you know, am I making sense? Like that blew my mind. Cause what I had done, looking back at it, is I had folded marathon training into my norm. Mm -hmm. And so my norm, it was my norm. So I was training a lot more. And the same running that would have lost me so much weight per day or per week in the beginning wasn't going to work after my body had fully gotten used to all of the mileage and the training by the end of that year. And even though I was faster in the marathon, I was almost definitely heavier in during the New York City marathon. Um, it was just so it's weird. It's like a, you know, it, it's this this your body is more like this cacophony of simultaneous outcomes at all times that's incalculable almost, and it's doing it on its own, and. Um, yeah, I never realized that I would be able to, I just kind of intuited that, hey, your body's going to get used to this activity. So we got to find a reason to keep doing the activity besides the calories it's going to burn. I kind of understood that. We've talked about that with, with clients before, you know, how, and, um, but that, that really blew my mind and let me look back and go, oh, okay. And it makes me recalibrate everything I'm doing right now how I'm, how much stock I'm putting into my fitness pal and the tracking and all of the stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I was thinking is like, when you're talking about marathon training mm -hmm. in the very micro, you have to really pay attention to caloric intake, yeah. right? Like I have, I have bonked in every long race I've done just because I wasn't getting a hundred calories an hour. Mm-hmm. Right. So, but what we can take that idea and apply it like really broadly to our whole life, as opposed to the hours in which we're, you know, the two hours before the race or the hard training run. Um, mm. you know, I was working with a group today and someone said, like, I think she was talking about uh, something Joel Furman said that you, we eat to build lean muscle mass. Right. Mm. That's the purpose of food is to build, not, we don't think about eating to lose. Right. Right. And so once you built your lean muscle mass, you stop. <laughs> All right. right? But, but when you're running a race, you're just eating, you're just eating sugar just mm -hmm. to keep falling down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's and the other thing that, you know, like it's not as simple as an equation, you know, it's like, oh, I'm doing all of this work. And let me just throw in the calories that make up for the expenditure and boom, that'll be done. But what there's time involved, you know, he was the way he was talking about how the body, this is this, it slowly happens. You know, this is a, we, however many trillion cells doing all these different jobs and, and, and it's not like, not like just because, oh, I didn't get into a deficit today, or I don't think I did. So therefore, I haven't, you know, deteriorated any tissue in my body. That's not necessarily the case, because your body can't keep up. It's not like, because I burned 10,000 calories today, all of a sudden, the body knows how to assimilate 10,000 calories and use that to fix everything 
before your next workout, you know, there's a, there's a time component in there that I think I've been missing a long time in, in my running, you know. He's got a whole chapter in the book that you're going to love about like endurance athletes and mm -hmm. sort of limits like Michael Phelps and the people who run across the U.S. And, right. you know, what, what are the physiological limits? Like how much if, if let's say you're you're spending 6000 calories a day on your training. Right. How, how much can you eat? Like there's a limit. There's not a there's not like a limit in terms of like, you know, the, the guy who wins the hot dog eating contest at Coney Island every year. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how many calories your body can absorb and process, right, which is which turns out to be sort of the the limit for of, of athletic achievement, is how much you can eat to support the training and the work. Right, how much your body, how like how not only how much you can eat, but how much can your body, how much capacity does your body have left over to assimilate what you ate on top of your training like to do something with what you ate because we're using. So, and that's what it just made, like when he started talking about, you can do that over time, but eventually you have to pay the piper because these, because you, your body's robbing calories from other systems to try and squeeze down to a more normal rate, including. So um, I, I, I'm, I can see in my mind what I'm trying to say, right? I get, but it, but it's not coming out right. But you know what I mean? It's like the, the it's it pulls calories away from the healing process, from from defending yourself from colds. You talked about how you get sick after almost every big event, and I'm the same way. I get I get sick almost after every big event. Um, same thing. If I'll get I'll get into my training. And I'll get going and I'm following the plan rather than listening to my body, which that's what this is all about. He's talking, he's speaking the language of my body. He's saying words my body's been trying to tell me for years that I haven't been able to hear, you know? And so not listening to your body and just listening to a training plan um, can get me injured because it's like, no, I need to get this next workout in. I want to stay on track. And every time you do that, you're robbing yourself from, you're robbing your body's capacity to heal from the last workout. And you can get away with it for a certain amount of time, but then there's a, there's a, there's a, a break in the chain at some point and you just, you get a, you, you get a failure in one of those systems. And on the other end of it, like you also don't, need the sweet spot stuff that y'all talked about right how there's it seems like you can't yes 60 miles a week might be might exceed our body's natural capacity but where is that sweet spot like you said like what if we do really want to we don't want to starve but we want to be active and lean where where is that now it's like it's weird that we have to calculate it nature would have normally provided that environment to us but it's weird. We, we're trying, we're going through all of these very complicated means to like figure out a sweet spot when, you know, all the animals around us are in a sweet spot at all times. It's like, right. Well, we have, you know, we all have the same evolutionary fitness. Yeah. Right? The, but just, we've created a, a world in which evolution, what, what evolution has given us is largely irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. And I also never thought about fire as a component of our biology almost, you know, that was very interesting to me how he talked about fire as like part of our evolution, like, cause we've, we've had fire for so long and it's almost, it's all, it's virtually necessary to our existence, fire, the ability to be able to create fire and do things with fire is like part of our calorie burning system. It's part of how it's, you know, we've given up these other things to grow the big brains, to walk upright, to do these other efficient metabolic things. But we've learned how to help like sort of pre-digest calories externally with this fire thing. And fire has been around for a million years. And when you think about it like that, like not, not, not fire has been around for a million years, but 
us harnessing the power of fire has been around for a million million years then you can be like oh we've we've our biology has evolved to require fire potentially that that was fascinating to me i'd never thought about fire that way you know well because i mean a lot of the way i was taking it in was through what you taught me about naturally attainable quantities yes it's 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 part of that yes right like when i was pushing back a little bit about yeah you can live on a raw foods diet but some but the fire is there somewhere right some external energy source has to be harnessed cylinder right in the cylinder of the tractors or in the truck in the cylinders of the trucks that are hauling it back and forth right all of that or the laborers who are you know you're buying their metabolism essentially yes. like that's what got me it was like oh we can understand the entire world as energy flow yes the way y'all talked about an energy economy like the calorie economy blew my mind that was that was fascinating to tie it all together the external and the internal and how it all matters we can worry about our internal calories and and go raw like y'all were talking about but in, in the bigger scheme of things it's you know we're using so many dinosaur calories to get the watermelon in the middle of winter or apples out of season when we live in louisiana or all of these other these other things that that there's a bigger there's a bigger calorie uh economy that that was that part was really fascinating as well you know yeah so i'm curious how you said like you're starting to re, you know, rethink a little bit um, your own training. Right, right. Because I've been, because you know, like earlier in the year and towards in last summer, um, you know, I got some help with nutrition. That that help was really more, I've really been wanting to get leaner, you know. Um, you know, I, just like what you were talking about, like how you work, you, you ran all those calories, but it's not like you got skin on muscle lean. Right. And if we were really staying in this zone two low effort running and doing all of these fat burning type workouts, why weren't we like super lean? Right. That was, that was interesting. That was interesting to me. And I want that. So I, I've always want, I'm, you know, I know I'll have extra skin, but I feel like I have extra body fat that I could get rid of. And so I went down the bodybuilding rabbit hole a little bit, at least just the nutri nutritional component of it, because I figured who knows how to get lean more than bodybuilders. And um, and so that really got me sort of going into the caloric deficit and understanding like I need to be, uh, you know, no matter how much I'm working out you know, I want to stay at that 2000 calorie diet a day or whatever it was that I was on at the time. And that just started to feel untenable for me. I was hungry a lot. I found myself overeating. I would go for strings of days where that would work well with me. And then I would, then I would, you know, slip off and, and be five, six, 800 calories over my, my budget for the day. Um, and I found myself doing a lot of that. Not only that, but I found myself introducing a lot of uh, so more, more, more processed food, right, to, to, to achieve it. And um, so I could kind of get the nutritional components I need, um, get the calories I need, uh, but not have to eat piles and piles of kale and, and, and broccoli and all of these other things that would you know, tear my guts open and, you know, it could be just too much volume. So I was playing with that and working with that. And, um, and just recently, because, you know, this is from a bodybuilder perspective, bodybuilders aren't really ultra runners. They don't really understand, you know, they know that they work out and on a 2,500 calorie a day, they might be at a 500 calorie, 800 calorie deficit, but at a 2,500 calorie a day in that given day, I might be at a 3000 calorie deficit based on what my workout regimen was that day. And I just felt like, you know, it's up to me to kind of figure that out. So recently I put all of my activity back into my, my calculation on my fitness pal. I had taken it, I had taken it out. And so I was just worried about calories going in in the day. And then, so I put it back in and now it was giving me a net. 
it's given taken away and it's adding back calories that I can eat to make up for the the uh, activity that I'm having. And honestly, that was I read that in I read in um in Matt and Robert's book, the plant based athlete book about the 60 20 20 split, the carb split. And so the bodybuilder guy had gotten me into um, counting macros and paying attention to that stuff. So I understood that And the 60 40 40 sounded a hell of better. I felt like it would give me a lot more energy. And so that's what I that's what I did is I, I I added that back in there, but that feels like it's too much. You know, it feels like it's a lot of calories. I'm satisfied, but I'm going to bed with 1800 calories left to eat at the end of the day. And that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem I'm full. I don't feel like I should still need 1800 calories at the end of the day. So what his podcast and y'all's conversation did was like, okay, it's not either one of those. It's about finding where your base is and that sweet spot of getting just under just a, just a sustainable deficit of that um, over time to help get leaner and leaner. That's different than anything that I've ever done. I'm under, like understanding that sweet spot. That's all. That's huge. Well, I just, what just came to me is like, cause I asked that question because Harry asked me to ask it, like, what's, do we know what's the sweet spot for losing weight? Is it like a hundred calories less per day? Like, like that the, the body doesn't start going into slow down and, and self-sabotage, right. right? It just doesn't notice. And making cortisol and all of these stress yeah. response things. And what, what he says in the book, I don't know if we came out in the conversation was basically that when you, most people who are obese, it, they think their body has totally fucked up. Yeah. But in fact, the amount of weight you'd gain in a year is essentially a rounding error of calories. Like how many calories do you take in in a year? And if you're, you can take in more than that and you gain maybe five pounds a year and from 20 to 40, you're now, you know, a hundred pounds overweight. Right. Or, right. Or if you're eating the way you did. Right. Right. With a lot of extra stress, maybe you're doubling that uh -huh. you gain 200 extra pounds, but still like, it's almost like your body doesn't notice because it's under this threshold. So I'm wondering if we can just sort of flip that in the other direction, maybe cut it in half because gaining calories is probably your body's less freaked out than, than a deficit like surplus mm -hmm. is kind of good, but I'm yeah. wondering if there's, I mean, it'd be such a cool study to do. Right. To kind of measure the things that we can measure that would tell you your body is or isn't in like rebellion against the deficit. That's right. The rebellion against the deficit is the thing that I've never really given credence to. I've never really given credence to. Um, I, I, I know how to talk about it and I know what people say about it, about, you know, Oh, if you starve yourself, it'll just make it worse because it'll make it harder to lose work, weight. But man, the goal was always to just have a, a deficit and lose weight. And I had lost so much weight that, I mean, who's who's going to tell me that I'm wrong, right? And not realizing that there's, at the time, there's there's more to this than just sheer, you know, loss of extreme excessive adipose tissue now i'm normal fat i'm normal regular you know 190 100 200 pound guy fat you know and I, how i have been all the way through the runner's world cover and everything i'm like the regular normal amount of fat that what what average joe uh carries around but i'm just 200 pounds lighter at that that normal and so now i'm here in this normal guy land and I want what everyone else wants. I want to try and lean that up even more, you know, uh, and it's just a transition for me. Yeah. I mean, the thing I think that I found most um, useful was uh -huh. the idea that you're not going to overthink your brain. You're not going to, your brain is going to make you eat. It's going to make you think about food. It's going to make you jittery. Like you don't have a chance. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no amount of gogginsing you can do yeah. to overcome your brain on 
caloric deficit, on, on a significant caloric deficit, and that our brains get hijacked by this hyperpalatable food. Yeah. Like it's, you know, like I know everything, right? Like I've written all these books. Like if anyone should know how to do this, and I'm a, I'm a health coach, I'm a behaviorist. If anyone should know how to do this shit, it's me. <laughs> right. And I'm like, why am I doing that? Why am I eating overeating? You know, it's it's air fried tofu. It's broccoli with a with a very healthy from a vegan plant based doctor approved cookbook peanut sauce. Mm -hmm. Why why am I still ten pounds and I and I exercise like crazy? Right. Why am I still ten pounds overweight? I know what to do. I'm gonna fast for a week. Maybe I'll do ten days this time. <laughs> And it's insanity. And it's just, you know, as, as if I was trying to override my cortisol response or, or trying to override when my stomach sends out mm -hmm. uh, gastric juices to digest food. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all the way back to that first book, To Hold. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's mind numbing, you know? Um, I had a thought I was going to write it down and then, and then I didn't, and I forgot what the heck it was, but I had a, I didn't want to interrupt you. I'm trying to stop interrupting people, but I forget about what the hell I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> uh, what, were, what was it? What was it? We were talking, what you were leading, you were saying well, that rebellion against the deficit. Right. Right. Hell, I don't know how, or, but, but anyway, well, I hope um, it comes back. Uh, me too. Me too. Uh, I was trying to listen to you and hold on to my thought at the same time. I'm terrible about that. That's like, it's like I feel rude because I interrupt often and I've been on TikTok and tick it's like the algorithms is like suggesting to me that I must do this often because I'm seeing all these videos about, hey, next time you're talking to someone, stop thinking about something that you can say that relates to what they're saying and just listen to what they're saying. I was like, damn, you know, I do that all the time. But the problem is I forget about what the hell I was going to say. Well, I, I read a book by uh, Gabor Mate about ADHD, adult ADHD called Scattered. Yes, that's me, a thousand percent. Well, so I think it's all of us these days. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's another example of your brain's going to do what it's going to do. And you, you know, for you, to take responsibility for it is just going to make you miserable. Yeah. You know, you can think about, okay, here are strategies for dealing with it. Mm -hmm. right? The way I'm coming up with these strategies for eating much blander food. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm eating like boiled potatoes. I'm got, I've gone spud fit sort of like I eat other things, but you know, I have a bunch of boiled potatoes. I eat two for breakfast. They're small. Oh, I remember. Go oh, good. I think Mother Nature had it right. Our brain has it right. Evolution has it right. We're supposed to think about food all the fucking time. We're supposed to. <laughs> That's what every other animal does. That's all they do. And so <laughs> we're right. We're supposed to be thinking about food all the time. But we're supposed to be using all of our time to find it. That part is missing. So we think about food all the time, but we have it everywhere. Like just like every other animal, we're supposed to think about food 24 seven. That's the main driver. That's what moves you through this planet is search of more calories. So that part of the, that is so right. And to fight against that is just, just futile, you know? Um, and it, yeah, so n nature would have nature would have made us think about nature has made us think about food all the time, but in an environment scarce of food, or at least hard to get to, not necessarily scarce per se, but it's not on a buffet. Yeah, and and so I think we we try to like try and beat ourselves up about all oh, I can think about is food. I'm such a fat ass, man. Why do I do that? Why? Do I? No, that's I think. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, well, that also explains the, um, the size of the pornography industry. <laughs> right, exactly. Agreed. All we're supposed to think about is food and sex. That's what every animal on this planet does. 
that's how you keep going as an animal on this planet. Otherwise, you like you're talked about in a um, museum, you know, as an extinct species. Yeah, it's almost you know, it's like you know, the, that's the pleasure trap, but yes. it's really the attention trap. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even the pleasure of food. Like when like the people that I know who are really struggling, it's it's the yeah, there's the pleasure of the moment, but mm -hmm. there's the constant anxiety. Yes. Of and I, you know, and I grew up very comfortably middle class. We always had enough food. It was never like, oh, there's a one pot and nine kids, and am I gonna get enough? And I still felt, you know, I would go to a buffet or something and I'd be at the end of the line and I could feel the anxiety. What if they run out of the, you know, pasta primavera before I get there? Yeah, right. <laughs> or what, you know, like the, the server takes the thing away off of the chafing dish. And I'm like, God, I hope there's another one. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, it, you know, it wasn't rational, but it was a brain doing what brains do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I grew up in, I didn't, we weren't, we weren't poor, we were broke. I think that's, I think there's two different <laughs> things, you know? And, and uh, so we lived check to check. And when I was a kid and, you know, groceries lasted until they lasted and we didn't get more groceries until it was time to fiscally, like, you know, financially when dad would get paid. And so there would be times where, you know, we weren't poor and starving, but there were many, many times where, you know, you would make sandwiches out of just, you know, mine is and chips and, you know, or you would just, you know, all of these things, but you constantly, it's just an example of like, even when you have things that don't make a meal, like me in my world right now and plant-based food, like even when I have the components of something that aren't really part of a recognizable meal, they'll still go together and be food if you want it bad enough, you know? And like everything, like your creativity gets excited when when um, you start thinking about food. Like there's just so many mental components to this to this calorie discussion. That's That was the other thing that we, when y'all were talking about that just, um, you know, the mental side of it and, the, and a lot of, and then it's a whole nother subject, but a lot of the, the scarring and self-hatred that comes and causes further mental stress and anguish and, and, and dis-ease in people because of that natural, unfixable part of our brains that cannot stop thinking about food. And I get that. I really do. I, I mean, I don't stop thinking about food either. I just switched up what I ate. You know, and you know me, I've fought against the minutia of food creation. I, 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 I don't, I don't like going there. I like just being and but I can't but it's because I can never. It's like I've never really got my hands around not worshiping food in my brain. Hmm. So it gets dangerous, get, even in the plant-based world, it gets dangerous to give it too much lead, to give it, let it have it hit, let it have its head too much, you know, to use a horse term. Right. And, and one of the things we talk about a lot is like, get your pleasure from life. Yes. Right. Which is absolutely true. And if we find that we're falling down on that, it's another reason to beat ourselves up as opposed to this acknowledgement that like, yeah, the brain is a food seeking, is a calorie seeking, energy optimizing machine. Right, right. And the activity, the exercise, isn't really about the calories we're burning to lose weight. When The longer we think about, about, about it that way, the, the, the less likely our regimen, our, our, our lifestyle is going to be sustainable. It's more about a placeholder for the activity that would have been required to get the food that we can't stop thinking about. You know, it's like a, it, we need that, that all goes together. You know, you get a bird or a squirrel loves to eat what it eats, but if you put it in a spot and just feed it its favorite food all the time, it's got an existential crisis. It's a, it's a, it's got a problem. It can't, it's not really being a squirrel, you know, 
Right. Well, it's like, um, you know, when I first met you and you were talking about, you know, hunting and like what it meant to you and the challenges mm -hmm. that, that same year, I went to the New North Carolina State Fair and they had a turkey shoot. Like in a cage, literally people with rifles pointing at the turkey that couldn't go eight feet in either direction. Like yeah. that is like the metaphor for for our our existential crisis, let alone right. all of this, all of this sportsman and this this the the stuff that we do in Louisiana that makes us call ourselves the 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 sportsman's paradise is toxic imitations of those food those those food acquisition things, you know. I, I, namely hunting right because hunting fishing is another version of hunting it's all about hunting to me means going out into the wild and taking a live fellow animal fellow earthling home to consume as food right that's normal in our existence no i'm not i'm not arguing that what i am saying is the default, so when y'all talked about hunters and gatherers meshing their rewards together, and right, that, that, that resonated with me. And so the hunters aren't always successful. The gatherers are. You know, so that made a lot of sense to me that, okay, by default, this is what our diet would have been largely made up of. We get so caught up on vegan or 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 keto, we, where we, we remove nuance. And the nuance is more along the lines of, of what, like, uh, you know, I can only, only think in terms of Instagram handles, but found my fitness on Instagram, Rhonda, I can't remember her last name. Yes, her. You know, she talks in more, more like Furman about nutrition, where they talk about animal products being a part of a healthy diet but in in its real like way tiny form you know um and that that just spelled out a good it spelled out a few things to me it spelled out why we're communal animals why we should work together and this rugged individualism is kind of that that seems to be running in my world the world that i live in and it seems like I've, you know, it's a whole nother subject, but, but the point is, is it feels like, it feels good to understand that we're supposed to be together and work together um, to make up for the shortcomings of other people's, you know, life giving, like of other people's, um, food acquisition protocol you know uh well, yeah and well, yeah it, spe it speaks to the importance of diversity mm -hmm. yes right? as a risk management strategy right and because we we depend on these external we we because we're so inefficient like you were saying in our metabolism we kind of need to work together for food which we have but our work together for food has been bastardized and toxified and turned into a, a, um, a, you know, a capitalist profit model. And it's extrapolated to the point to where the people who are providing food to this communal thing is actually making the people worse off because of the food that's being provided. I don't, I don't know. It's almost like as if, you know, the hunter was so successful that everyone stopped gathering and all we did was eat meat in the tribe. And then people, you know, got constipated and started dropping a heart disease and all of these other things. And, but the guy who's making, who's bringing all the meat was, he was King now because everybody was so happy. Like, I don't know another analogy to put to it, but we live in this lopsided world of people doing good stuff like feeding, feeding our country it was actually wrong. We've extrapolated it to the point of toxification. Well, it wasn't it one of the, one of the Ishmael books talks about yeah. civilization started when we locked up the food supply. Yeah. Right. So if you have all that meat, then you got to guard it from yep. the other tribes. Then you need a whole class of soldiers and police 
to, uh, to enforce the new rules. Right. All, right, all, so. all in the name of ensuring your food supply, you know, when it hasn't gone anywhere. We live on this planet Earth. I loved how he was, how Ishmael talked about it in the book. Like if I, if I starve, if there's no food, then I die and I become food for something else. And I was like, wow, yeah. that's so powerful and beautiful and completely untenable in America. That idea, nobody's going to sacrifice themselves for others in that, in that sort of way, you know? And uh, that was just really for, especially for nature. It's like, oh, no food. Well, I must die then. So then I will become food because we're all the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some, something, you know, I, I asked him like point blank, uh, Dr. Ponser, about like, why does our brain do such, like if we, if we are in a caloric um, excess, um, why does our brain do such stupid things with the calories that make us sick? So like, right, like, like the point of exercise is so that we, because we have this constrained energy budget, if we spend 600 calories exercising, that's 600 calories we don't spend elsewhere. And uh -huh. the places we don't spend it are infl you know, chronic inflammatory response. Right. Um, you know, the stress system that becomes hyper responsive. And I said, like, why, you know, why do we do, why does our brain do such dumb shit with it? Right. And I loved his answer it was like, it happens so rarely that we, it was like a windfall. It's like, if you, if you get, it's like you get a bonus, a $2,000 bonus you weren't expecting. You're, you're going to spend it on all the things that have, you've been neglecting. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Like the immune system has been sort of tamped down. We've, we've got this chronic, we've got these uh, ringworm parasites we haven't dealt with. We're sort of living with it now. Let's fucking, you know, take care of this stuff. Right. Like, you know, I, and the, I loved it. Like my question assumed the stupidity of the, of the strategy. And, and he just immediately put into a context in which it made perfect sense. Yeah. Like this idea that that rest itself it represents a windfall, that I don't have to go run today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about your your business school training around, you know, how you spend money in a business. Yeah. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. Let the record show for the audio listeners that Josh is thinking. Yeah. Something's coming. We'd... Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I'm, um, yeah, nothing, nothing in particular. I just, I'm just kind of soaking, you know, on, on that, that concept, that let's, idea. Let's, let's, let's bring it back to your training now. Mm -hmm. you're, you're still, sure, like thinking about uh, you're the one who got me into like 60 mile weeks. <laughs> right, right. Molly, like, <laughs> right, right. Like, where, where are you now in terms of, you know, thinking about limits and rest and what all that means in, in this context? Well, now, um, I think that I've always given lip service to recovery, you know, and recovery effort stuff and making sure that I give my body time time to recover between hard efforts. It makes so much more it, that has taken on a whole different light now because I can't just make up for overtraining with extra calories to make sure that, you know, I really need to give my body actually the time to assimilate and recover and adjust to what it's dealing with. And, um, and that has made a huge that has made a huge shift in my mind about what I think I want to do going forward. Um, one thing is like, if you notice my run Sunday, I didn't lie to myself. You know, I did exactly the zone two heart rate. So, I, and even though it, it, I had to do a 10 30 pace 
to, to stay there, but I did it to stay there because I don't want to exceed what my body can handle, even though I can do it in the moment. I know I could have ran faster and that probably won't catch up with me running faster than true recovery pace for months. It won't catch up to me. I could probably make it all the way to Chicago and kill and do good and be proud and train poorly the whole time. But I'll wind up right back where I was in 2017 or whatever. And so that's not what I want. I don't want to be constantly going back and forth like that. I want to just, I want to stabilize. And so I think where I'm trained, where what's different is I think I want to be, um, I, I want to find out where a good spot for me is metabolically, like in my, I don't, and say, let's just hypothetically, hypothetically say that my base is 3000 calories a day. And if I go and I run, you know, a thousand calories worth of running, I don't need an extra thousand calories to make sure that I'm not wasting muscle or whatever. All I need to do is make sure that my base rate is really taken care of. Um, and that's, that's new. I just need to know what that I would like to, I don't know if there's a hack or a way to, to determine that. Uh, I know that there's formulas and stuff, but he was talking about some, but I would like to understand that so I could stay in that 500 calorie sort of real 500 calorie deficit, not me, because my fitness pal is way off on the, on both things on the food calories going in and the calories going out. Well, I'm, on, I'm wondering for myself whether, yeah, like, yeah, there's all the complicated formulae and, and um, you know, measuring things and on a regular basis, but coming back to whole, like, I, is, like, can my body do it? And what are the, what are the conditions? Like, I, we, we know our bodies can do it because we have inherited a million years of evolution that say we can, but what are the conditions? Like here's, instead of me trying to hack my brain, right? I'll use my brain to mimic the conditions under which my body can do it. Yeah. Right. And so that's, for me, that's like, I decided no salt, no sugar, uh -huh. which means no sriracha, <laughs> no Tony Shackery's. Yeah. No um, maple syrup and a tamari. The enhancers, right. Yeah, and like those are the things, like I can so easily, oh, we just, we just made a tofu. So the whole, the whole block of high protein tofu, 650 calories say, I'm sharing it with Mia, she'll have 150. I could, do, I could go 450 along, along with everything else. And then there's some left in the air fryer. And I'm like, I'll just finish these. These are good. <laughs> right? and, that's, exactly. and that's my brain going, you know, lighting up like a, like a pinball machine. Yeah. So I'm getting curious as to like, instead of trying to manage everything the way whole taught us not to, right. You know, can we, can we manage just the conditions, the context in which our bodies operate? Yeah, the environment, like the, right. Right, and the Hadza, you know, like he has a whole chapter about how they go out and gather honey. And they're just like <laughs> eating, like getting as many calories as they can from honey because it's so efficient. Right, but, the, but they're not doing it every single day in their coffee, you know, or, you know, and, yeah. And that's so, that mimicking is exactly what me getting to a whole me becoming a plant-based ultra runner was about mm -hmm. was mimicking what I thought my authentic human butt naked self would have been doing is moving a lot and for the food to find it. While that's true, I think that what I've wound up with is a somewhat, you know, toxic imitation of of that because it's i live in a world where there's infinite food therefore i'll always have food around to 
make up for the caloric deficit that I choose to put myself into by mimicking the physical parts of what I think a human, authentic human life is. But if I'm being real, in its default state, a human being is not going 100 miles as fast as it can. It's not going 26 miles as fast as it can. It's doing all of these other massive, these other very important calculations, you know, um, about feathering the throttle and adjusting your effort so you can make it to the, like all of these things that are life or death, not like, oof, let me stop at this aid station and get some potatoes and uh, some Gatorade in me. Yeah, I went a little too hard that back then. Like there's no food in, in the environment of the authentic environment of the human to make up for a miscalculation in energy expenditures. You know, it's, it's not readily available like, like it is today. Well, and the other thing that would have been readily available is you do, doing almost all of that with other people, with your tribe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Like, think about us going out running alone. Like, that's weird. Yeah. And when you're with your tribe, you're not going to leave the slowest person behind. Everyone has their, everyone, we're traveling together. Maybe they straggle behind because they take on a different role with the pack and, and you know, and they'll come in to the rear for whatever reason we get ahead and we set up the shot we set up the tents or whatever the hell whatever yeah well you, know? you remember yeah. i think we were in, we were in marshall and there was like we were doing i think it was marshall somewhere we were doing a long run like four in the morning at a on a highway it was like a loop do you remember that yeah yeah and you came and found me in your truck because you were worried yes was, that was marshall i was going real slow you were Right. Where's, like he should be back by now. Where? Yeah, because we ran from the hotel. We were meeting everyone. I had a twenty miler to do that morning, and you and I were gonna just run to the group run spot in downtown Marshall, but we were staying up by the interstate. Yeah. You remember? And we ran all the way in, which is I think five miles or something, maybe maybe more. And uh, then we ran with the crew, and then I ran. I ran all the way back before the talk that that morning. Yeah, but I was real glad to see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was on the way in. Right, exactly. Exactly. But I came to scoop you up, of course. Yeah. Of course, I was worried. Yeah, because that's that's normal human. Is the, uh -huh. Exactly. It feels good, like, when you're in an ultra and you know where you crew, like, oh, my, my crew's going to be at mile 30 or my crew's going to be at mile 20. And all you... And you like when you can hear them and like you have your own little calls that you do to each other, just knowing that they're just knowing that your, your tribe is there is amazing. It, it's, it's, that is what it's about. You know, that's what it's about. And I've found myself sort of gravitating towards being, um, being with, being with rather than trying to like, be a part mm -hmm. you know like oh yeah that's and then come back to the to the group like you saw how fast i did oh boy that was cool like you know that was i, I want to be with the group i want to be with and and use this capacity in some other bigger way rather than feeling good about only myself feeling good about myself and about an achievement and all of that stuff and i think that that's a, that's normal. That's also going to regulate the energy expenditure. I think I'm drawing down to a more a more sustainable and arguably more authentic way to participate in this very innate human activity we call running. You know, it's just our it's just our you know our niche mode of transportation as as an animal, and um, but I think. Uh, yeah, I think I'm shocker. I've gone overboard on both things, on the running and on the food. You understand the volumetrics hack and you start understanding, you know, caloric dilution. And so you just, oh, and as a fat guy, how many times have I said that over and over to people? I don't really eat a hell of a lot less volume than I ate before. I just eat different food. You know, remember my big, my potatoes that I would mash in the kale and I'd have, a, I'd eat a whole guy dog 
a whole freaking uh, Instapot full of that, you know, by myself. Uh -huh. So I could feel full. And um, yeah, I think that there's a more normal way to deal with all of that stuff, the activity and the food and just trying to settle into trying to settle into that um, is important, but it's not, like you said, it's not just a brain hack situation. You gotta, we gotta, we have to mimic the movement, mimic the environment, the, the peace, the people, the tribe, everything. We gotta mimic all of those things. So the, so, you know, our food component becomes more of a, more of a natural default, I think, you know? The last thing I want to talk about is, you know, you and I have worked for five years now helping people lose weight, get healthier. And we've essentially done it individual by individual, right? Teaching people how to essentially create a bubble of authenticity around them. Yeah. So like we did, I don't think we necessarily understood this is what we were doing, but like so that you can live your life without constantly struggling. Mm -hmm. And what came to me from listening to, to Herman Ponser is this is really a huge public health issue. Yeah. That, that you know, things are just like, yeah, there's individuals. You know, again, we can goggins eyes it and say, well, yeah. anyone who has the grit and the gumption and the understanding can change it for themselves. But again, mm -hmm. it's like rugged individualism. When you, when you right. said that, I wrote down rigged individualism. Right, right, right. Right. Like there is, a, I think there is a responsibility for those of us who are doing it right to not just say, oh, well, anyone can do it. Or, you know, like I see, keep seeing these posts. Oh, it's, it's cheap to eat. You know, people say it's too expensive to eat vegan. It's cheap to eat vegan. It's not cheap to eat vegan the way I eat vegan. Yeah. I eat vegetables. I eat fruit. <laughs> That's expensive for people. Yeah. Like for like when we get there, I think we have a responsibility to to advocate, not just to show other individuals that they can do it as individuals, but to start. And I don't even know how to begin to think about this. Yeah. To start, to start to move society. And I see, you know, I see you doing this with, you know, Black Men Run, with some of the work you're doing around urban redevelopment. Like it's 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 not just about eat kale instead of no, no, it's about, it, that's what I was telling my friend. It's about, it, for me, it has become more and more and more about, about growth. You know, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. It's, I'm not, a, I'm not really, you know, I'm not into veganism. I'm not into whole food plant-based ism. I'm not into running or into weight loss. I'm into growth. I'm into moving forward through this world in a way that feels better and better with every step. I feel like, and I mentioned this, and this is a, this is a concept you helped, you helped me with was, you know, we talked often a lot about how Bam Bam's racism really permeated the entire family and, and my own psyche and, and how, as I changed throughout my life, you can't help, but think like, boy, boy, Bam Bam sure wouldn't like that, or he wouldn't like me being friends with that person, or he wouldn't like that I took this person in his boat, or he wouldn't like that this person was at his house. And you helped me think about how, you know, when that, when, rather than think of him being sitting in his grave, pissed off at me for being nice to black people now, he's sitting up in heaven, freed of all of his prejudices, you know, um, hoping beyond all hope that I do it different and he can't really connect and he can't really say anything. He can't really direct me in the traditional earthly sense of the way, other than just draw me forward with love, you know? And so where I feel the love the most is me going towards that reality towards, towards my memo and Bam Bam sitting in heaven going, baby, we were so wrong about so many of the things we told you. Can you feel it? Can you feel us trying to pull you in the right direction? Follow the love, you know, follow the love. And that's, that's what growth does for me. That's what love does for me is it pulls me towards growth. 
if you let it. Because it all centers around love, Howie. I, it hurts me to think about how many kid pigs I've killed and while he screamed. It hurts me to think about how many rabbits I've killed while he screamed like babies or how many, how many things that I've done in my life. It hurts me to think about all of that stuff. It doesn't hurt me to think about, you know, Black people have been downtrodden and mis miscategorized, mischaracterized, marginalized. If you just really look at it, and it feels good to love instead of make up excuses why it's all their own fault. So following love brings you to better answers, I think brings you to, to more authentic conclusions. And we get caught up in the calories and the activity. And I think so much of us being able to maintain in this very chaotic, unnatural world has to do with um, sort of following that scent trail of, of you know, the ooey gooey feelings of love, which in, in a modern rug American society full of people who considered him rugged, rugged individualists is a weak thing. That's soft. That's not a thing, you know, to care about the other people. I'm going to get mine. I got to get mine, you know, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a tricky thing. And when everybody taught, I, I, that's all that just, that's, that's what this feels like. Understanding the things that we're talking about, these components of, you know, it feels like it feels like love for the human. It feels like love for whatever, whoever force is our maker. Why, why ever we're here to respect these natural defaults is just more love. And the more you can pay attention to loving our maker, loving the fact that we're here, the universe, the chemicals that put us in here, whatever process, I want to respect it, honor it, and love it. And I feel like as long as I'm doing that, I'm not going to have any slippage going backwards because I'm trying to constantly do a, a calorie counting plate spinning trick. You know, mm. it's, it's more real. Yeah, and it's, you know, the other thing that I got from his, from Ponser's, you know, history of evolution, humans are the and species, we're the sharers, the hunters That's and right. the gatherers, right. and the problem with that is we have in our brains a circuit that wants to say who deserves my food, mm -hmm. who's coming to take it away from us, and it's another, you know, this is un unlike capitalism or the extractive economy, this is like, this is where we can grow. We can say, oh, right. They're all my brothers and sisters. Yes. Like, yes. That's a, that's a hard thing. It but is. As you said, like, I've never, I've never regretted anything I did out of love. And I've made mistakes. Like, you know, like. Even I've, if it had hurt. I've, right. trust, I've trusted people who betrayed me. Yes. But like, I did it out of love. Like, it's okay. Yes, it's the, you know, the, the things I remember with that I can still feel the, the pit in my stomach about are the mean things. Mm -hmm. Right. The, 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 the comments I made because I wanted to be better than somebody else. Yep. Right. That's not the right way. That's not. And just like with the, you know, the spikes off of our basal energy uh requirement you know that's unsustainable living that way we can get ahead for a little while being that way but we can't just free fall into a, a, a natural existence we'll always be fighting you know the 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 weightlessness the you know comes from love like our the ease the uh, the lubrication towards growth i think for me has come from love the more i apply love to the equation 
the better off it becomes. And people may call con call me being contradiction, contradictorial or whatever, being a contradiction, um, because there are people who might argue that, you know, oh, you, you're not treating me with very much love, but that's not, that. that's okay. My point is I'm, maybe it's not reciprocated, right? I'm focusing towards growth. I'm for focusing towards where it's needed. And as I, as I sort of come to conclusions and the clouds get lifted and, oh, these people maybe have had my tolerance, but have not had my love truly. They haven't had me there and being there and giving of myself and my time and my available funds and money and whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, well, that's the model of, of yeah. gather love is, oh, I got, I'm going to give you some of what I got. Yes. It's, it's a sacrifice. Yes. Yes. And people I'm learning will get extremely butt hurt over that if they don't exhibit the same amount of love as you do. It, it almost feels like a flex to some people, I think, you know? I'm not sure I understand. Giving, love, being, wanting to say, you know what? I know I fought this way for a very long time, but I always kind of thought that it was wrong or whatever the case may be. I'm... I'm going to flip it around. A lot of people don't have the ability, don't have the desire to do that. Um, and I think that a lot of times that as you grow and move towards love, some of the relationships that get lost in the wake, that get left behind, are people who aren't willing to or not able to exhibit the same type of unfettered love to others and giving to others that you are able to and it creates some tension that's what i mean like there's almost a there's almost a um but for different reasons whether it's you're born into a certain job that allows you freedom of time like myself or whatever the case may be there's always a component that in our modern society that really keeps from keeps people from being able to be giving because there's a calculation that has to go into everything. Hmm. Yeah, I guess then that's another um, another reason to look for systems to shift rather than just blaming the selfish people for being selfish. Mm -hmm. Right. The, yeah. We're all operating on, you know, uh, brain algorithms. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. whatever oh. anybody does, yeah, whatever anybody does, there's a good evolutionary reason for it. It's just, right. It may not be uh, optimal, mm -hmm. or you know, it may be a zero-sum game or a prisoner's dilemma. But you know, like when I look at billionaires who are trying to own the world, and I think, well, if I don't feel safe except where I am in control, then the only option I have is to try to own everything so I have control everywhere. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So again, to, you know, to kind of return again, that we're the problem with this is that it's unsustainable Yeah. for us as a species and for us as, as um, you know, stewards of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's a hard, that's a, yeah, that's a difficult one, you know? It's, it's just such a, it's, it's so big um, and so relevant and, and so avoided, yeah. you know, because everybody's caught up in their own little cutter ant part of the, you know, world. Everybody's carrying their own little leaf <laughs> back to the hive or whatever, and nobody's but that's not what we are. We're we're more of a we're meant to be communal together, biomass type of a group of animals. 
Man, it's it's a uh, it's crazy. There's so many things at one time that my brain goes to when we talk about these things, because it's all interconnected. And all it keeps bringing me back to is everything is everything. You know, everything is everything. Everything's connected. Uh, um, I'm sure yeah. I'm sure Herman will be delighted as a like hard nosed scientist to be like, what did you get from my work? Everything's connected. Yeah, yeah. We are all one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's let's wrap it here. This was a really rich conversation. I'm so glad we took the time to have it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Howie. I appreciate I appreciate the time. It's been nice catching up with you, man.